What's Emily the Strange? I believe it's some comics. You've seen this. Yes. She's, and she's on like t-shirts and stuff like that at Hot Topic. Is she? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. But is she more of a, like a brand or was she a brand that became, got her own story and stuff like that? I thought she had a story before. Um, but that just outstripped her story. Like she was created by somebody. I'm really prepared. Here's why here's why I bring it up. Sure. Is because apparently Apple, who is trying to get into the TV business. Yeah. I mean they kind of already are, but you know, with original content. Yep. Has ordered an Emily Dickinson series. An Emily Dickinson series. Is there an echo in here? <laughs> uh yes. I mean, I love Emily Dickinson. Which but... <laughs> well hold on to your butts. Uh, which will star uh, Emily Steinfeld, or not Emily, um, yeah, Emily, no, Haley, Haley Steinfeld. Okay. Uh, who was um, the girl in The New True Grit, and probably okay. some other stuff. And she, I think she's got a singing career. Anyway, she's, you know, dark hair, thick eyebrows, like, perfect, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and it's going to have, like, a modern sensibility, quote unquote. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that because it's, it's, Emily Dickinson was kind of a loner. Well, hold on. Let me finish. Okay. Uh, it's written by uh, a bunch of people and produced by a bunch of people. Uh, one of them is David Gordon Green of the Pineapple Express what? film. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, and it's written by uh, Alina Smith, who wrote on The Affair and The Newsroom. Okay. What? <laughs> but it's yeah. going to be a, apparently a modern comedic take on the Emily Dickinson sitch. So I don't know if that means it's going to be set in like the um, early to mid 1800s or if it's going to be a full Amy Heckerling uh, razzmatazz of the Emily Emily Dickinson story. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I heard my phone buzz when it died. I should have charged it. (laughs) I'm not Uh, quite sure how I feel about that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, she's the belle of Amherst, but. (laughs) She sure is. Um, I mean. I've seen like a solo play with Emily Dickinson and her like doing some of her poems and stuff like that. Like a one woman show? A one woman show, oh, yes. And I can't remember the name of the actress who portrayed her, an older woman, um, very well known stage actress. Um, well, I don't know if you've seen Emily's uh, headshot here, but uh, looks pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a real Aubrey Plaza type. I guess. It's going to be, uh, it's going to audaciously explore, this is from the copy, uh, the constraints of society, gender, and family from the perspective of a budding writer who doesn't fit into her own time through her imaginative point of view. Oh, my God. So now we've got like a comedic period piece with cutaways. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Because I I could not stop for Lyft, it kindly stopped for me. (laughs) Something, something, five stars. Uh, Anything else? uh, Any other opinions on this? Um, Are we at the bottom? Is this the bo- Do you hear the scraping sound? Is this it? Yeah, this is this is kind of a weird project. Sounds like to me. Um, I like I said, I love Emily Dickinson. I just kind of want it to be true to her material and not. I mean, she has some comedic poems, sure, but hmm. she was quirky. Yes. Not sure if I go comedic. Um, but I don't know if we want to go full comedic and, you know, do cutaways and stuff like that. Well, it'll that. be laugh and learn. It'll be that situation. Or was the scraping, the bottom of the earlier barrel was the zombies and the and the sea monsters and the prejudice. And yeah. The, hey, it hurts me. Sure. And then we broke through and they're like, wait a minute. There's other stuff down here. Right. So we've got to do this. Uh, what else is next? Uh, a Nathaniel Hawthorne road movie <laughs> or something? Um, or an Ambrose Bierce road movie? Wow, William David Thoreau, like Henry, yeah, right, horror <laughs> flick David or something? Yeah, right, yeah, horror flick, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something lives in Walden Pond, <laughs> and it won't leave you alone. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the thing that we're looking for. So okay. 
This was not the end. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was not the end. Oh, my gosh. The trend will continue. Yeah. And as it does, we will follow it as we follow all the trends on the Just Enough Trope podcast. I'm your host, Caliban, joined as always by my co-host. Hi, I'm Ikan Hana. And um, not so hot. No. Not so hot today in the studio. Yes. <laughs> so thank thank the gods for that. Yeah. Still sipping on the Fruit Punch Mio, though. Okay. Well, that's good. You got to stay cool. You have to. Yeah. And we always do. And yep. uh, we're here to bring some of the news from the world of nerdy entertainment. Um we are back. Uh, we weren't sure we were coming back today, uh, but we decided to, to come back today anyway um, mm-hmm. because we've got to get ready for Convergence That's this right. year, of course, which we'll be attending as we always do. What number is this? Five? This might be the big five Oh my for gosh. Us. Um, it's either five or six. What's five? I'm trying to... Paper? Rock? Scissors? <laughs> <laughs> the anniversary in my voracious quest I'm for knowledge sure. I, I don't know at some point you get you run out of books and you just get down to the almanac like the back and front covers of the almanac yeah and so i had, had at one point uh learned all the precious and non-precious gemstones okay um the all the anniversaries sure uh just worthless worthless information and then at one time, I, th- I tried to get the um, the zodiac signs. Yep, and it didn't stick. Okay, maybe it's because my mind just rejects th- that whole thing in general. Okay, uh, astrology, which I don't believe in, um, and wouldn't accept that information. But for, you think twelve things I could remember? Yeah, but I can't. Okay, that's okay. Um, you have memorized many other things. So yes, I definitely have. Um, I think. 2013 was the first year we went. So yeah, it absolutely was. 2014. Yep, and the so math this brings is the you to. Year. Is that how that works? Yeah. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, so we'll be there. Uh, as usual, we'll be talking to quite a few creators there and bringing, passing the savings and the interviews on to you. Um, we won't, uh, I won't elaborate right now. Uh, we've got a couple things booked, but w- as we get closer to the show, we'll talk about who we'll be talking to yep. while we're there. Um, the theme this year, no theme. Here's the theme. No theme. It's 20 year anniversary. Yeah. Well, That's again, the, the 21st year or something right. <laughs> technically however years work out compared to anniversaries but yeah it'll be just a celebration of pretty much everything mm-hmm. uh which kind of sounds like no theme to me but yeah. uh, it's a it's a big party it's a big deal it's been around for a long time yeah and so more information on that in the future uh so anyway back to today news talking about a pair of films uh which an old classic and a new classic uh, I think we would like to talk about 1946's Gilda, yep. which you saw recently and have some thoughts on. And this was one of your polls. Uh, I want to talk about 2002-2003's City of God. Yep. C- Ciudad de Deus. Yep. A Brazilian uh, Portuguese film. Yep. Uh, which is about people in bathing suits. <laughs> if the poster is to be, be believed. Yes. Uh, it's hailed as a modern classic. And we'll be talking about it. Yep. It's intense. It is intense. It's intense. When you said, I want to watch that bathing suit movie, uh, you didn't know what you were getting into. No, I didn't. I you had were a like feeling... a chicken running through the favela. Yeah. I had a feeling it was going to be intense somehow, but yeah. I didn't know how. But no tents, though. No. These people are poor, but they have houses. <laughs> it's only technically That's true. tents. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how you doing? I'm doing well, Cal. How how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, I am getting anxious. I'm having dreams about the con already, which oh, is boy. weird. Yeah, that's um, uh, disconcerting a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, just the usual, like you know, I'm running around. I'm late for something. I'm not going to get there in time. Uh, people are angry at me. You know, the usual stress. Oh, stress dream. That's fun. Um. I don't like stress dreams. They stress me out. Of well, course, yeah. naturally. But what's your brain doing? The idea is you're, you're supposed to, by confronting it, I guess, you... You're preparing yourself? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I guess feeling that way psychologically or like virtually will lead to me preparing a lot so I won't be in that situation. Yeah, I think so. But based on my past experience, five or six times doing this, yep. I know that however prepared I am, I'm still worried. <laughs> Sure. I still feel like I'm not prepared. Right. And even if by some chance I have not prepared or prepared incorrectly, I'm still going to do it. And I'm th- confident enough in my own abilities to know that it's probably going to turn out okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think of some situation where we were in a situation where we talked to somebody 
and it just just crashed um i don't think it's ever fully crashed um that's qualified when did it partially crash um well i just i remember talking to sometimes we talk to people and they're not always (laughs) open or um we get on a subject that they don't want to talk about and they make that clear i you (laughs) um I mean, I don't need to spare anybody, but we'll just, you know, we won't get super specific yeah. uh, at this time in particular. Um, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's one person. Yeah. And we're thinking of the same person. Mm-hmm. And so that's one out of, out of every single time. Yeah, I know. So your sometimes means one person. You're right. So maybe it's the person. You're right. And at the same time, that person, <laughs> that person was saying something about we were talking about a specific subject mm-hmm. the person didn't you know made it clear in what i thought was a you know sort of archway that yep. they didn't really like this thing yep and so i took that as encouragement to continue to talk about it which i feel like i did <laughs> maybe someday we'll talk about what we're talking about uh, and i felt like the interview was entertaining yeah but uh after we walked away i was like oh they might have not Really wanted to talk about that. Right. We didn't hold them down or anything. No. I mean, so I don't feel bad about that. No. I don't feel bad about it either. But you've apparently still carrying a torch. Uh, it just was... It it was slightly <laughs> uncomfortable. That's all. It it wasn't as bad as, as you're making it out. Okay. Sound. You're probably right. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, we wish Mr. Cosby uh, lots of luck <laughs> in all his future endeavors. No, just kidding. Uh, let's talk about the news. <laughs> So the thing to do, of course, is to start with movie news. And since we're at the end of another weekend, I thought maybe we'd talk about the movie Box Office, The Return. Sure. Um, we've got a solo. Yep. We've got a solo. Yeah, we do. We'll always have solo, mm-hmm. um, at least for another week or two. Uh, it's back again, of course, this week, looking at a almost 70% drop off. That's not very good. That's really, really bad um, yeah. for a Star Wars film. It brought in another... About thirty million, um, okay. keeping pace above Deadpool at second place at twenty three million. Which think about this: you've got a Disney blockbuster which costs probably upwards of three hundred million dollars, mm-hmm. uh, along with um, uh, advertising that is in its second weekend making thirty million. You've got Deadpool making around twenty five million in its fourth weekend, something like that, or fifth weekend. Yep. Um, also, a very expensive film, but doing all right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not looking good. I'm pretty tired of all the think pieces. Where does Star Wars go from here? Why right. did we reject this? 11 reasons why Solo was destined to fail. Whatever. Right. Whatever. They're just going to make another one. Of course. I did something I didn't want to do today. What'd you do? I unsubscribed Jenny Nicholson today. You did? Yes. Why did you do that? Because I just, the, her last couple films, or films, eh, I guess they're videos, they're films, um, have been about something that I just didn't really care about. Like, um, like I don't hate My Own Little Pony, but I don't want to watch it like an hour movie or, or video about it. Sure. Because I just don't, there's no context for me. I just don't really get it. Yeah. So it's either like My Little Pony or she'll just literally read um, fic, like um, fanfic. Okay. Uh, which I don't really want to do that. No. And Or she'll just bash Star Wars. Okay. And, I mean, maybe I'm a Fairweather fan when she's there to bash Hope, you know, a Rogue One, like I'm down. But when she wants right. to bash Solo, a movie that I liked, I'm out. That's understandable. Maybe I'm a bad fan. Mm. But her her latest video is like an hour long and it's all, I just didn't want to hear how bad Solo was for an hour. Sure. So, I don't know. I'm not done forever, but. You're done for now. Done for now. Yeah. Because people hate this movie. Yeah, I know. Except all the older fans who I feel like have similar taste to me, um, a lot of the writers that I know have all posted, saw Solo, a lot of fun. It's not perfect. It's right. great. And that's what I want out of an off-year Star Wars movie. Like, yeah. I don't, you know, let's get back to the whole, you got to come with me, do this. Oh, we're all bad. We all buy weapons from black market people. Right. Suicide bombing or whatever right. the new Star Wars is now, the new thing. I'm good with a cartoony, just light as air uh, kind of film on the off season. And yeah. So that's what we do. I'm no, no kidding. I'm, Not a perfect film. No. It, maybe it's a little airs lots, but it's. Airs lots. 
sense, but you Would know, you put that dictionary down. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. But a, a little ersatz. But uh, it's okay if it's cotton candy. You know, it's supposed to have some levity. I think. Now track back to us talking about some film uh, 18 months ago that was like, mm, it's, it's just fun. And we're like, no, this is serious. That's a heart attack. <laughs> you don't understand. That's true. The Care you Bears that. represent a lot of, no. <laughs> uh, so um, this is probably the last we're going to report on Solo, don't you think? Probably. Unless Alden Ehrenreich kills somebody. This is pretty much Let's hope not. the last time we'll say that name. And I think I finally got it right. <laughs> Uh, this time, uh, speaking of other movie related news, moving to the DC camp, yep. uh, we've got a little more information about Wonder Woman 2. Okay. Uh, Patty Jenkins, of course, will be back. I think yep. Jeff Johns is pretty much taking the full reins here um, as the script guy, Okay. Uh, although there are other contributors. Uh, and they've confirmed that the setting of the film will be 1984, specifically. 1984. Okay. What are we going to do with that? Um, are we doing a... Orwell thing here? Or? An Orwellian thing? Yeah. Uh-huh. Wonder Woman's going to run down the aisle and throw throw a hammer <laughs> right. through a screen. Right. Uh, with Kristen Wiig's face on it. Right. It's just uh, one of her SNL, the target lady. <laughs> no. <laughs> your, your time is over, target. <laughs> uh, or something. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. And that's Probably kind of all we, all we know at this point. We do know that she'll be playing, uh, Wig will be playing the cheetah. Yep. And what's he, Mahutsi? What's his name? Um, the guy from uh, Narcos is going to be in it. Okay. Uh, the guy that plays Mar- Narco, you know. Narco? Mr. The main, Narco. The main Narco Pedro guy. Pascal. Okay. W- uh, will be in it, so. Okay. It's a little on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, who's a, who's a guy that plays an 80s guy, like a crime guy? Right. The guy that plays Escobar, bring him in. Let, yes. Be like if they're like, let's do a '60s movie. Uh, what's John Hamm up to? Right. Get me Roger Slattery. Yes. Like, they don't want to do that. Yeah. They want to do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, John Hamm would be a good uh, DC villain, don't you think? Well, I think so for okay. sure. Is there a dapper DC villain besides uh, Gentleman Ghost, of course? Mm, Two Face is kind of dapper. John Hamm is Two Face. Yeah. Somebody's pitched this before. I hope so. Against a um, well, we don't know who's playing Batman at this point, but yeah, I know. Um, in a in a Matt Reeves directed I'm film, I'm sure they'll tell us I'm Batman. So, what about John Hamm as Batman? That I could have. I see some possibility yeah, there. <laughs> what do we think about when we think about Batman? <laughs> when, when we think about crime, oh. I think about my parents dying <laughs> on that cold concrete. Oh no! Here, let me show you some slides. <laughs> Something like that. Um, bad news on the Sony Marvel side of films. Uh, oh, no. It looks like the silver and black movie that had been announced from Sony is starting over. Uh-oh. It had previously been set for February 8th, 2019. It's pretty clear at this point that that's not going to happen. That's not good. No. That, Why that are is... they starting over? Well, uh, because they don't have it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, it's going to be it's in turnaround. Basically, um, the director Gina Price Blythewood has said that it's uh, it's not going to happen. Um, they this is of course is based on um, Silver Sable and Black Cat. Yep. Um, to supporting Spider Man or supporting Marvel characters, and it looks like with Sony's focus on Venom for right now, yep. um, this thing is going into turnaround. So, how long does it go into turnaround? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we also know that um, Price Blythewood is working on the Marvel Cloak and Dagger series. Okay. So, which has got to be in the can, I assume, uh, by now. Yeah. Um, but I've heard some good things about Cloak and Dagger. I've heard nothing. Okay. <laughs> about this freeform series. Yeah. Um, but I did see that trailer. Yeah. Maybe I saw like a. Maybe they released the first two or three minutes or something. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. it just goes on that list of like. Shows I probably don't have time to watch. Yeah. Like, I've heard Gifted is good. Mm-hmm. I've heard. Right. I love Legion. Yeah, I love and Legion, I'm too. two episodes into this second season. Yep. That I think is almost done. Yep. And the third season has been announced. Mm. It was picked up. Yeah. And I'm like, yep, still powering through the, the expanse. <laughs> right. Know? And uh, Westworld. And boy, how do people watch all this TV? I don't know. It's a good yeah, question. No, I don't know either. Got to have a lot of time on your hands. Yeah. 
So that's it. That's all I got to say about it. Um, I don't know what they even would have done. Um, I I mean, was it cast and everything? No, I don't think they really had anything. Okay. So yeah, it's it wasn't on the level of you know their Venom film, which is solid. It's pretty solid. Yeah. You got a Jenny Slate. Oh boy. You got a Tom Hardy. Yeah. Some people you gotta follow them around, and I follow people, and you don't follow people, and you suck, <laughs> or whatever it is, you know. Uh, I mean, I know yeah. it, it's like he's he's. You hear him talk normal. He's got an English accent. Yep. Um, I think he's English. I don't know. I think so too. Uh, and it's like you get the get whoever got Cumberbatch got took him a couple films, but he's pretty good now. Yep. Get that guy. Mm-hmm. But it's like, all right, Tom, you're going to be American in this one. He's like, yeah, all right, God, I'm American, okay? It's like, <laughs> uh, well, uh, can you like, can you just talk like, like normal? What? This is my American accent. I'm talking. I'm normal. I know. You know? I know. I'm also walking here. <laughs> I don't know if he just learned from like the movies that he likes or something like that. I, I don't know. Just No, just like. The regular, I want a regular, mid-Atlantic. What about like a Midwestern accent? Right. You mean like this? Like I'm going to do this? It's like he learned from somebody else doing like the My Fair Lady thing. Like he like <laughs> learned like by having marbles in his mouth or something. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And he just never, you know, perfected it. Yeah. The rain in Spain. Pain. Falls mainly on the plane. in the East River. Right, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think he's got it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I'm looking forward to Venom, I guess. Um, other bad movie news. Looks like the Crow remake is down again. For See, this an immortal creature. Me. Yeah, well, it keeps getting up, though. Yeah, It keeps getting up. Jason Momoa is off the project. Okay. Corin Hardy, the director, also left the project. Doesn't sound good. Yes. And uh, Sony looks like they're about to possibly drop it as a thing as well. They were set up to be a distributor, and if they go, then we don't have anything. Okay. But, yep. Well, that doesn't sound very good, but were we really aching for another Crow film? <laughs> well, <laughs> they've been trying to make one since the first one. I guess. Uh, there, were, of course, were sequels. Uh, apparently, this all has to do with Samuel Hadida, who's the guy who owns the rights, basically. He owns okay. Davis Films. Uh, and so they're like the you know production company, and I don't know I don't know what the specific creative problems are, but at yeah. this point we are. How many times have we reported on this? Like the last time we reported, we we were like, "Think okay, we'll never after the next thing you hear will be a, re- a review." Right? No, no, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Mm-mm. Solve their solve Davis's films problem right now. Give me a star. Give me a director. Oh boy. Um. Uh, I'll get you started Nicolas on Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I would. I would kill. I would kill a man's wife and him to see that uh, happen. <laughs> um, no. Uh, let me get you started on the director. Um, he. It's too big. He won't do it. But Zack Snyder. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Grim. Gritty. A retarded sense of art and sexuality. <laughs> you know, uh, well, let's say that he can't get the Fountainhead uh, financed because he wants to make the Fountainhead next, which uh-huh. explains. Oh, oh, that explains everything about you. Now we understand. Wow. Yeah. You probably kicked a rock real hard because you couldn't do Atlas Shrugged one, two, and three or whatever. So right. now he's going to do the Fountainhead. Uh, but see, he can't do that. So we bring him over here, violent. Uh, washed out uh, visual aesthetic. Right. Good to go. Who's mm-hmm. his star? Um. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Remember when his name was on everybody's lips? Yeah. Has he? It still kind of is. Yeah. Because apparently they want him to do um, what is it? Mysterio. Yeah. We reported Mysterio. on that last week. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like it's not quite so much anymore, which is factor of maybe him being a little more choosy he doesn't want another prince of persia yeah his price has probably gone up probably he's a little older and also do you think an actor just gets an air of like exclusivity where it's like either we couldn't get so and so or like so and so wouldn't be interested right because in a similar vein 
Ryan Gosling was the guy that you just, he was the first name on every list for every movie. So yes. it's like, all right, we're doing it. Dickinson. It's going to yep. be great. Right. Let's get Ryan Gosling and then remember not. No? Okay. Well, we'll move on to right. Nicolas Cage or whoever. Right. Nicolas Cage is Edgar Allan Poe and he teams up with Emily Dickinson oh and they're going to solve mysteries in Baltimore. <laughs> it's the telegraph wire, right? Yeah. Hurdy gurdy. <laughs> Something like that? No. Um, or never more. That's interesting. Yeah, forget that. Um, let's get our star. Um, Who's the oh guy boy. from. <laughs> uh, the kid from. Uh, who's the. He's in a band. Uh, some kid from a band. Pick a band. Jason Schwartzman? Jason Schwartzman, I guess, probably is technically. Jason Schwartzman is the crow. <laughs> But which one has the beak? Yeah. I mean, he'd be kind of a goofy I'm really mad you guys killed my wife. Yeah. (laughs) And now I'm going to kill you. Right. And he does it with, you know, I don't know, a ruler or just something Um, implausible as a weapon. What about the guy who plays the Punisher? Something quirky. No. (laughs) John, uh, John, not John Favreau. John Favreau is the crow. (laughs) There you go. We nailed it. (laughs) Kills everybody, makes some lunch for everybody. (laughs) It's baby's money. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I think we got it. Um, just moving on to TV news. Actually, no, I have one more um, movie story I want to talk about. Okay. Do you know what a spawn is? Do, Do I prob- know what a spawn is? The fact that we're about to talk about a spawn movie means that it, after 20 years after the comic came out, means that the comic must have enough cultural cachet that you probably know of spawn, even yeah. if you don't know spawn. Yeah, I think right. so. Nailed it. Uh, it's been more than 20 years, by the way. Uh, well, it looks like uh, Jamie Foxx is going to play the main character, Al Simmons, in a new Spawn film. Okay. I think we had talked about this maybe a couple months ago on the show uh, when Bloomhouse, uh, the paranormal activity, found footage uh, horror movie company that's yep. kind of starting to spread out, uh, picked up the rights to Spawn with Todd McFarlane directing. Oh, boy. Really? Yes. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I know he created the character, but come on. He did. He That's did. having like Todd, what's his name? That's like, like Sue Grafton directing A for Arsenic. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Bad, um, bad, bad pick. Should have gone <laughs> Janet Ivanovich for One for the Money. <laughs> uh, did you direct One for the Money? I better I double check on that. So. I better double check on that. Yeah, so anyway. It's going to be great. Oh, my gosh. Or, or it's going to be a great film. And I'm going to, you got to make a film. It's You need a lot of baseballs to do it. Oh, my gosh. I don't really have a Todd McFarlane, but, you know, you can just hear it. You can just already hear him talking about it. Yes. They posted a picture on Twitter or tweets, tweets, man's grams or whatever yeah. it is of them together. So okay. what does this represent? This is going to be a probably mid-budget movie, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Um, Oscar winner Jamie Foxx. Will play Spawn, a washed up superhero. Yeah, who is a washed up superhero? <sighs> Boy, directed by Tom McFarlane. I mean, he was a How Spider-Man think this is villain get? already. Do you think this is going to get all the way? This might get all the way, or, or like another comic property about a guy who's dead and comes back to life. Will this do a crow? Um, I could see this going either way, honestly. Yeah. Um, I mean. Jamie Foxx is an interesting choice, I feel like. Uh, but we haven't seen him in much lately, so... Um, Tequila. Yeah. He's in Baby Driver. Oh, that's true. He was in Baby Driver, but not for long. Yeah, he was kind of a backup guy in yeah. Baby Driver. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That Oscar curse, man. You win an Oscar and see you later. I know. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, hopefully this turns out okay. Yeah, Hopefully. But the funny thing about uh, McFarlane, well, there's a lot of things, but um, one of the funny things is McFarlane, Liefeld, a lot of those image guys, their whole beat was Marvel, pay us more. You're having the best years of your life. We deserve more. Right. You don't give it to us. We're going to create our own company. And they did. And they did. And so that it's like that. It's like the. (laughs) Okay. Ready? It's like that sketch. On SNL, way back in the day, when one of the times that Jim Carrey was hosting, maybe the only time, I can't remember, uh, where he's the guy that works in the office, and he tells somebody, he, he's very meek, 
but somebody screws with him and he tells him he'll see them in hell. <laughs> and everybody's like, wow, <laughs> nice work. Nice work, Fred. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Right. And then we cut forward six months later and everything is, I'll see you in hell. It's like, <laughs> Fred, uh, I got a couple different coffees. Do you want cream or sugar? I'll have cream and I'll see you in hell. <laughs> okay. All right, Fred. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and he just keeps doing it, right? Until right. Tim Meadows is like, Fred, I hate to do this. Because it'll give you a legitimate reason to use that phrase, <laughs> but you're fired. And he's right. Like, well, I will see you in. He has a heart attack. Oh, oh my Fred, gosh. No. What was he going to say? I guess we'll never know. <laughs> and then I won't do the whole sketch, but later on, eight billion years later, you know, they're all in hell. He's like, hey, I told you I could see you guys yeah. here. Oh, okay. gosh. Have you met Ben Franklin? All right, I did the whole sketch. <laughs> it's like they told Marvel to screw themselves this one time, and the rest of their life became just telling everybody they'd see them in hell. Yeah. So McFarlane has been very successful, but there have been a lot of lawsuits and a lot of screw yous and a lot of I'm backing out of this contract and I'll just buy mm-hmm. it. And you know how I felt. <laughs> He's got his job done. Yeah. Jim Lee's smart, and he just kind of avoided that by just working for it. He went right back to work for the man, and now he is the man. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And to beat him, you have to beat him. Yeah. As, as we know that Rick Flair, uh, Rick Flair told us. So I don't know. Like, this could go a certain way, and then we might get a situation where I guess he can't get, have creative problems because he is the creative. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. I predict it'll eventually happen, but I'm not sure Jamie Foxx will be on board by the end of this thing. Okay. Yeah. Plus you're a guy who, you're Jamie Foxx, now I'd like to wear a mask or just be a digital character for the rest of the film. That's true. Yep. Then your face is gone from it. Yeah. Yeah. Does he have the balls to Ryan Reynolds this thing? Maybe. That's my question. <laughs> we'll see. Let's move on to uh, TV news. Uh, okay. This is not big news because, I oh mean, I don't know if I should care or not, but it looks like uh, the Heathers reboot will have to find another another new home after it was pulled at Paramount. Okay. Do you know about the Heathers reboot? I did not know they were doing that. Um, really? Yeah. We've talked about this before, haven't we? Maybe we've avoided Maybe we it. Maybe we have. I don't know. It's icky and I don't want to talk about it, but... It was basically uh, ordered at TV Land, of all places. Okay. Uh, the idea is is that it is a um, TV modern-day update in the Dickinson fashion sure. of uh, the original 1984 movie, um, Heathers, uh, 88. It was later in, in the 80s. Yeah. Um, starring one of writer, Christian Slater, that whole thing. Yep. About, you know, sort of reject kids who are in a clique who are tortured by the clique kids and then right. they go on a fun murder spree in high yeah. school what a great time what a great time to do this and yeah, i think this no is partially kidding. behind what uh the problems that the tv show is having although the twist on on it this time is that the kids that are uh, mean and get killed are a transgender kid a gay kid uh you know like a i think another gay kid anyway they're just like they are the outsider kids. Yeah. And they're going to get killed. Great. That's exactly what we want to portray. Mm-hmm. No. It's awesome. Uh, it's, it, I think it's in poor taste, and I think that's why the, it keeps getting the boot. I think it's because kids keep shooting each other in high school. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Who wants to take this on yeah. when... The reality is... So it's an unintended side effect of a horrible, horrible situation. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it had moved around, I think, to Spike TV, and then it was going to be on Paramount, and now it is with, currently without a distributor. Okay. Bad news. That is bad news. Yeah. And um, good riddance. Um, here's a show that now does have a distributor. Netflix can't stop. Yeah. Netflix is... What is Netflix? I was going to say uh, the Nuovo Riche of the uh, TV world. Yeah. That's possibly true. But they're also just, they're that like friend in college who gets their first credit card and suddenly everything's on them. Right. I think that's what uh, is going on at Netflix. They have ordered two series, Lock and Key. Oh, really? Yes. Which, as okay. you and I know, has been in production for years. Yep. Um, I can't even run down all places they've been, but they sure. were at Fox. Um, each time producing a pilot uh, that was didn't go. Yep. And most recently they were um, under Carlton, Carlton Cuse, um, the showrunner of Lost, um, amongst other projects. Okay. Uh, was at the helm. 
and they had not gotten picked up at CBS or maybe a cable network, wherever they were. Maybe sci-fi? I think it was sure. sci-fi. So anywhere, somewhere. And so they're back. Uh, they All have right. just been straight ordered to series. Uh, Carlton Q is still on board. Andy Muschietti, director of It, will be directing at least a pilot, I think. Okay. And as far as I know, I think they're going to redo everything, though. So sorry, mm-hmm. new, new cast. Um, We're stripping that. And... Yeah, but it is going forward. Okay. Well, I mean, that sounds promising. If it um, only had been made in Europe, it would already be in its third season on Netflix. Probably. Am I right? You are right. Yeah. That's my Netflix observational humor. Yeah. There's a lot of European shows <laughs> yeah, on Netflix. But when you look at the shows that Netflix is interested in buying, like Dark, The Rain, um, The Returned even, you know. Yep. Uh, I mean, this, yeah, this is a homegrown thing that would fit right in with that. Mm-hmm. Did we and ever cover the comic creepy. on the show? Yeah, I think we did. What did we say? Um, I I enjoyed it. Um, it's about a young family and um, this place that's haunted. and Right. But you liked it. Yeah, I liked it. I am impressed by Joe Hill's ability to adapt or to inherit his old man's ability to make the amazing very mundane and to draw... A story out forever that probably just could have been wrapped up already. Yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. Um. Same thing. <laughs> um, speaking of switcheroos and whoop de doos uh, we were just talking about Deadly Class last week. Yep. And there's some not great news. It looks Uh-oh. like showrunner Adam Targum has been replaced with Mick Betancourt. Okay. Uh, Targum has overseen the show from its development, uh, from the initial adaptation from the Image comic book till okay. till its development to a series. Well, that's kind of disheartening that he's been replaced. Yeah. At Creative Differences. Okay. Is the old saw that is going down there. Great. I mean, we have seen um, promotional pictures, um, a trailer. Yep. Uh, we've heard the Russos talking about it. Yep. And so it looks like, you know, probably a lot of it's, I assume, ready to go. I think so. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, there's no release date announced just yet. Uh, but yeah, so they bring Betancourt in. He's worked previously on Chicago Fire, The Mob Doctor, and a lot of things that are nothing like Deadly Class. Oh, great. That's going to be great. Yeah. Hmm. Sci-fi. Sci-fi has issues. You do it to yourself. Yeah, they do. What could the creative differences possibly be you ordered two series yeah a show about teenage murderers yeah Mm -hmm. in the drug in fueled 80s yes who kill without compunction Mm -hmm. and are running scared from a character named f face yes only he didn't say f yeah exactly where were the differences did adam targum did adam targum go guys we got this is for kids. We got to clean this up a little bit. <laughs> and then, okay, well, we're going to bring in the guy who works on Chicago Hope or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> He's the hard ass. You watch it, right? What I I don't I don't know what could have possibly happened. Do they want to sell uh, Funko Pop Sio dolls or something like that? I guess so. And it's like too too gritty and dark. <sighs> But the comic is gritty and dark, so I can't, I mean, like, the the original material is like that, so yeah. I, I can't understand, like, if... Well, you can buy something like, I heard a fly buzz when I died, and try to make it funny somehow, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I just wonder, you know, how, how the tone is shifting, or who got mad at what, and what doesn't fit for who, because you know the network's behind this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the network... We have spoken long and loud, loud about uh, recently, so we won't yep. do again here. But I just wonder what they didn't like about what was already going on. It's a good question. Yeah. Because um, as far as I can tell, it's going to be done pretty closely to the um, original that's material. Said. That's what the Russos told me. Yeah. That's what That's what Rick Miranda was saying for. <laughs> so... Um, no word from the Russos or Remender yet about this, but okay. uh, we'll tell it, you know if we hear anything. All right. Shoot. I was looking forward to that. Yeah. I hope it's still good. I hope so, too. All right. 
Is that it for the news? I don't have anything to end it. Mm. What's another um, Emily Dixon poem? There's one that's like, are you a stranger? It's like, are you a stranger or something like that? I'm nobody. Who are you? Yes, that's who I was. That's just what I was thinking of. Well, hope is the thing with feathers. Yeah. Or that's somebody in a bird costume trying coming to kill you because they're an assassin. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some films. Uh, I wanted to talk real quick. This isn't really on the schedule, but I we I, it would be a mistake to not try to talk a little bit about Gilda. I agree. Um, because just caught that recently in a new. They said it was a, a 4K. Uh, remaster mm-hmm. I don't really know I've seen it I believe I've seen it on screen before and it looked just about as good then so I'm not saying it looked sure. bad I just didn't I couldn't see Glenn Ford's individual nose hairs um, <laughs> but it did look great um, it's one of those that's um, was shot well and has survived and, and looks real fantastic it's weird yeah. to think that it is 80 years old yeah over 80 years old now mm-hmm. uh, what is Gilda about I love your uh, summaries. Oh, boy. No pressure. Um, Never is. Gilda is about... um, Rena Hayworth plays a woman named Gilda. um, And she's a free spirit. She's married to this guy named Munson who owns and operates a casino in, uh, I believe, Buenos Aires. Um, And... um, she is somebody who likes to flirt with people and she likes to dance and she likes to have a good time. Um, and it drives Munson's right hand man crazy because he's supposed to keep her in line. And it's not an easy task to keep after her. Um, she's always flipping her hair around. Yeah, she is. She'll just walk into her room and flip her hair around. That's right. Knocks and drink she'll look fabulous doing and, it. Yeah. Catches on fire. Yes. Gotta put the fire out. So, um, yeah, Johnny Farrell has, she's a thorn in his side, basically. Um, but they and, got a history. Yeah, and they hate each other. Right. It's a triangle. Yes. Of hate. And Munson says hate's a very powerful thing. Hate it is a powerful thing. Yeah. And Gilda's superstitious. Yes. Don't trick her into drinking a toast to cursing herself. That's right. Because she's super sweat. <laughs> it doesn't always make sense. No. <laughs> but um, but it's, uh, it's a really great film uh, in the classic noir style. I think it's around 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. So most people agree, uh, at least the modern critics do. Uh, it's directed by Charles Vidor, who directed a lot of uh, big films uh, of that era with um, Columbia and MGM, I think, you know, mm-hmm. the big studio films. Worked with her a couple times. Also directed her in uh, Cover Girl, which is a big uh, breakout movie for her a couple years before. Sure. Uh, did a movie with Doris Day, uh, you know, Mitzi Gaynor, and Frank Sinatra. And so did a lot of these um, big movies. Um, did A Farewell to Arms uh, later in the 50s. And it was written by Joe Eisinger, who was um, one of the writers of some of the uh, classic um, noir films of the time. Sure. And it has that feel. Mm-hmm. And when you watch it, um, what, just watching it recently, I was thinking, oh, yeah, okay. So, what, a couple, two, three years after Casablanca? I guess it's just Casablanca, pretty it much. kind of is. I never thought yeah. that before. I was always sort of caught up in its spell when I watched it previously. But as I was watching it, I was like, oh, this is just like Casablanca's little brother. Right. Which is fine. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. If you're going to copy something, you know, copy something good. Right. But it, maybe do an homage sort of thing. Well, so. it's not really an homage if it's only a couple years later. I suppose. I uh, I couldn't do a um, an homage to Spawn called v- Vermin. It's about a guy who dies. Right. And he's got powers. Right. Uh, I'd have a, oh, hey, I'm going to sue you. Right. Catch this baseball. It's Todd <laughs> McFarlane. Still don't have a Todd McFarlane. But yeah, it follows that like it's kind of crappy, greasy hero. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Right. He's um, almost stabbed on a wharf. <laughs> Yes. And that's how the story starts. And, uh, you know, the sort of sinister uh, older guy who 
they become great pals for some reason. Yes, they do. And then, of course, you throw the, the dame, you know, into the mix. Mm-hmm. And, you know, her name is, you know, above the title. And this was a huge hit for her. Yep. Um, and she owns the whole thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and unlike, I mean, there are a couple songs in Casablanca, but it's not presented like as a, like a musical number necessarily. Like yep. that's, except for the one huge musical number where they're singing the uh, national anthems or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, we just kind of stop everything and now you're going to watch her sing. Yep. And she can, and she sings and she dances she and plays for guitar. a part. Yeah. And for a part that is, you know, it's a lady part for the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which means not a lot of power, not a lot of agency, kind of about how she's controlled by these men. But yeah. even through that, she has a lot of power as a performer. She brings a lot of authority to that role. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if spoilers, I guess, or slight spoilers for an 80-year-old movie. The story, even at the end, lets, it lets them both off the hook. Yes. But it isn't like... As now that Gilda stopped screwing around, we can get this thing back on track. You know, it's more like she's been acting this way to hurt him. He t- he basically inherits this casino and then uses all of the resources at his disposal to make her life hell. Yes, and they both kind of come in at the end and they're like, "I'm sorry, I did all that." You know, this is driving me crazy. And the other person's like, "I." Same thing. Same thing. Right. I mean, I didn't have any money or power, and I didn't follow you around town all the, all the time. Right. But I also did some things, you know, that were specifically intended to make your life hell, and so they kind of reconcile in that way. Mm-hmm. And then Uncle Tio takes care of things for him. <laughs> Slight spoilers. Um, you hadn't seen this previously, had you? I have not seen this previously. What no. were your kind of general impressions? Um, what I was, the color? I really enjoyed it. Um. I thought Rita Hayworth was magnificent as Gilda. Um, she was really charming and disarming, and um, you rooted for her, even though she was kind of diabolical. Yeah. Um, and um, you just wanted her to get as much power as she possibly could and have control over her life. Yeah. Which she kind of gets at the end there, but... Yeah, I think that her performance was great. And I thought that a lot of times in these older scripts, the ones that we remember, I think, are the ones that have like real human drama and not just stock characters and like clever lines. Right. And sometimes in the 40s, definitely in the 30s, it could be kind of few and far between that you find that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought that for the most part, her part was written in a really believable way. Yeah. Even though and then her delivery sold it though Mm -hmm. so a lot of times she's given these lines like i don't know joe why don't you just blow it out your hoe or whatever Mm -hmm. but she would deliver it in a way that was arch but you could see kind of her maneuvering Mm -hmm. especially the way that she controlled munson and would kind of do this like code switching and but it wasn't just like (laughs) light my cigarette anytime slim and then like (laughs) like i'm dying on the inside like there wasn't any of that like she was Keeping it together, and, and except for the time when now it's just you and me, lady that dresses me, oh, I feel like tonight it's all going to come to a head. Right. All right. L- Miss, you have something on your nose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get that off there. Uh, except for some things like that, like, yeah, you just didn't, she didn't seem like this weak woman who was like, all I can do is just throw my tits at people. Like, it wasn't right. that necessarily. And it could have easily have been that. Yes. And then there was a couple, there was a scene or two where... He, he smacks her or he's told you know like the scene where he lures her back to buenos aires and the entire yes. time it's been a thing and then she's like Are you brute you brute and she's doing the whole thing that we get used to see like, uh, seeing women and uh, women in these movies do yeah but like, even then it was you? like she did the whole thing she gave it all yep you know she was totally committed to it and so i don't i'm not talking about it's not like i found a talking dog or something like i'm not going over this again and again because it's like oh my god a woman that can act it's not that it's just she was the only person doing that. <laughs> like, yeah. Glenn Ford was fine. It was great casting because if you had gotten like a better looking guy, yeah. I don't think I would have bought it. I would have bought that this guy was like eh, in the right light. He's good looking. He's definitely, you know, quick with a word and uh, a fist as long as you're not coming yep. at him from behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but otherwise, it's like he's kind of a low rent schmuck a little bit. Yeah. And then the um, uh, Munson is like 
you know, he's just wooden and cold, and he seems like yep. a guy that would stab somebody with a cane. He does. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, kind of a cutout. Yeah. And so I th- just think it was amazing that for the time we got a movie whose title character uh, was a woman who is just bringing it, you know, and has yep. all these dimensions. And it's kind of sad that even though she is the title character, she is still kind of the prize. Like, it's Johnny's movie. It's Johnny's VO. It's yep. Johnny's point of view. Mm-hmm. And he's just not really that interesting. No, and he's not really a great person either. No, but I mean, it's noir. They don't have to be. I suppose. It's not like what's his name in um, uh, Third Man. Yeah. Oh, man, I still I hear that zither. <laughs> Even now, the Zithers! <laughs> Sanctuary! So, um, would you recommend this film? I, I would absolutely, 100% recommend this film. I would too. I don't think it measures up to uh, Casablanca or the aforementioned uh, Third Man, but yeah. It's still a good film. It's a great film. Um, and I really enjoyed Rita Hayworth's performance in it, for yeah. sure. We were I was, As we were walking out of the theater, I said, I got a crazy idea, and I want you to let me finish this. Let me get to the end of this, right? Yep. Nobody's remade Casablanca. That's true. Because who would? Yeah. But they did make uh, remake Ben Hur, which is crazy. <laughs> which was a disaster. Uh, a Roman, a, a, a disaster of epic Roman proportions. Um, hear me out. Mm-hmm. Remake Gilda. Okay. See what happens. All right. Right. Yeah. You don't remake perfect things. You remake, if, if you even want to, uh, disasters. But you also remake ones where it's like, we almost got it. Let's try again. Yep. And on, but Gilda is 97%. I mean, it's great. But what if we took it a little more serious? What if we beefed up Johnny or either beef up Johnny to justify like the VO and his point of view mm-hmm. or get rid of it and it's just a slice of life type thing, right? Sure. What if we age everybody up? Let's put this like in the mid 50s instead of the 40s. Sure. So Johnny's in his 40s, Gilda's getting up there, and it becomes less a, uh, I'm just a girl who's on the run from New York for some reason. Right. Maybe I punched my dancing boss or something like that. Like, why is <laughs> she in Argentina? I don't know. But she's, it's more a desperation thing. Like, you know, I'm pretty hot, but I know it's not going to last forever. So I got to like land something here. Right. And of course, they've got more of a connection. There are German people in this film. Yes. And this is a little too soon after World War II, I think, for us to really know the full effect of seeing Germans in Argentina. 1946. Right. Right. So we move it to the 50s and it's more of a thing. You know, there's a whole expat community. Mm -hmm. You can add a Nazi subplot. Joe can be a gambler and a 'er ne'er-do-well, but maybe he's a former soldier, too. Maybe he was, when he was young, he was in the war. Yeah. So you take the kind of... A uh, Rick character from Casablanca, a yep. Rick and Elsa situation, he knew Gilda in the war. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And then you move them all into... And then also you steal other things from Casablanca, give us a couple extra characters other than the bathroom attendant. You get right. a young guy who's in love with a singer at the club, you know, like Casablanca. Not that. Not that. Maybe something else, but something sure. like that. Yeah. And then you start casting. Absolutely. You start the casting. <laughs> Christoph Waltz. Okay. He'll do anything. Yes. <laughs> so we have him as the casino owner. That's as Munson. Munson, right? He'll mm-hmm. have a whole speech that just slowly pans into his face. Sure. About the knife in the cane. Yep. He's my best friend. <laughs> you know? And I drink beer with him. <laughs> uh, Gilda is Ava Green. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. A little bit older. But still beautiful. I don't know if Ava can sing or not, but we'll take care of that. Sure. Uh, she's French. She can be French. Yep. She's from Europe. She's displaced. Yep. And then we get back to our boy, mm-hmm. John Ham. Sure. As Johnny Farrell. But we have to film it tonight. We have to film it right now. <laughs> because in 10 seconds, John Ham is going to be too old. Yeah. And then we make it a boozy. You know, John Han can look like a gutter trash guy, and then he can just clean it up. Right. He looks good. He's running a casino. Right. We throw a million dollars at this thing. hundred million dollars, what do you say? Yeah, I think it can work. Alfred Merlina is the police chief who we didn't even talk about. Sure, yeah. Get him back in there. I think that can absolutely work. All right. Yeah. You call Todd McFarlane, we'll get this going. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the uh, main event, what we're really here to talk about. Sure. Uh, we're going to move somewhere else, another couple hundred miles away uh, in South America to yep. Brazil. 
Yes. To talk about 2002's City of God. Yep. What do you know about City of God? What do you know, Joe? City of God is about um, some criminal gang uh, action. Ooh. <laughs> um, there's some young thugs kind of fighting for um, territory and being in charge of selling drugs. Where does this take place? Um, it takes place in the City of God, which is Rio. Well, it's a, like a western district of, of Rio. Rio. But yeah. 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 Um, Rio de Janeiro. Yep. Um, and they don't live in shanties, but they they do kind of live in the slums. Yeah, so. I call it. Yeah, it's it's shanty esque. Yes, for sure. Yeah, it's it's the favelas, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's what you think of as the um, the uh, low income slums yep. of uh, of Rio de Janeiro. Yep. Uh, so life is tough. Um, just about everybody has a gun, even like the young runts, as they call them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it's based on a novel, uh, which itself is based on the uh, semi-autobiographical experiences of a guy named Paulo Lins. Yep. Um, and it was directed by a guy named Fernando. Um, I'm not going to do these things, these names justice, but uh, Mireles. Okay. Uh, and also by uh, Katia Lund. Uh, who is credited as a co-director. Okay. Um, she's like a screenwriter. She's like a documentary documentary filmmaker, I believe. Okay. And she's kind of a transplant. I think her um, parents were Americans who came to Brazil um, and had her there. So sure. So she's kind of like Brazilian and American. Sure. Uh, but yeah, the, the Fernando uh, went on to a little bit of acclaim in Hollywood um, after City of God, of course, uh, was nominated for a bunch of Oscars. It become, became this big sort of international film hit. Uh, it made a lot of money. It made like a hundred million dollars, like in Brazil. That's a lot. So yeah, poor, but not that poor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> went went to that movie. Um, he made the Constant Gardener after that. Okay, which got high marks, but I did not think that was a super great movie. Yep, I think that it suffered from a lot of the meandering that we'll just we'll talk about pretty soon with City of God. Yep. Um, uh, and he made a movie called Blindness after that, which was not a good movie. Uh, which did reunite him with Alice Braga, who's in this film. Okay. Uh, who we'll talk about later. Yep. I got an Alice Braga thing. Yep. I think I've done on the show before, but I'll do it right this time. <laughs> remake it if you didn't get it right the first time. Right. So the remake of my Alice Braga rant. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty much it. Something that, to note about this film is that it stars uh, pretty much only one professional actor, a guy named Matthias Nachtergale. Yep. Uh, who played Carrot, the drug dealer Carrot. Okay, sure. And everybody else... Uh, is either uh, an amateur actor or a lesser known actor or literally somebody who lived in uh, the, one the of the slums. favelas okay. or the city of God. Okay. They went out and uh, did a lot of prep for this, actually. Um, a couple years before, they got a bunch of people. They had like mm-hmm. hundreds of people kind of like read and kind of come in. Sure. And by the time they uh, were done, they had, you know, like a group of like 50 kids and they did like a little kind of boot camp for them. Like here's not how to act because they wanted them to be natural, but they would be doing a lot of these street battle scenes and fighting and stuff like that. So they kind of had everybody learn basic blocking and techniques. And we're going to go through here. We'll do this. We'll do that. And there's actually, after this, um, most of those kids Mm -hmm. did not become actors. Okay. (laughs) You know what I mean? Sure. Um, some of them did, uh, Ana Braga, uh, Seo Jorge is in this, Mm -hmm. uh, who you might recognize as the guy who sings all the David Bowie songs in The Life Aquatic. Sure. Um, He went on to be an actor and musician, but a lot of them just kind of went back to their lives. And that's what, uh, there's a documentary called City of God 10 years later that came out a little while ago. Sure. Which looks at the lives of those kids. Okay. Who were in the film. All right. We're talking about this movie. Yes. This is not going to be, I kind of already asked, but I'm going to ask again. Do you think you can give like a 50 word synopsis of what happens in this film? Um, it's like a territorial war between two gangs. Um, but that's not how it starts. No, it starts like it's told from the point of view of this character named Rocket. Right. Um, and there's this triad of 
thugs, which includes his older brother, Goose. Everybody has a strange nickname um, in this. There's Goose, Shaggy, and Clipper, which are the which is the trio. The tender trio. Yeah. Um, and they do... They pull off this hotel heist. Um, and Shaggy's little brother, Lil Dice... Um, is pissed off that he's been made to be lookout, so he does a signal that their police are coming. So I guess like spoilers for the first third of the film. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I guess what I was looking for was it. It covers the lives of a group of characters. Yeah, <laughs> going from the mid to late sixties. Yep. To the mid seventies. Yes. In. The City of God yes, district Rio. of Rio de Janeiro. Yes. And it involves their lives, loves. There's a lot of uh, cocaine yep. and a lot of shooting. Marijuana. Yeah. And shooting. Right. And in the, in, the, in the crime film style, you know, we follow characters who are not heroic and are doing bad things. Yep. But yet we are deep within the pathos of their lives. Yes. Yes. All of that is true. Yes. Um, Rocket. Yes. Who, I didn't do a lot of homework on this, but if it's autobiographical, then I assume the guy that wrote the book... Was uh, Rocket. Yeah, is a photographer or journalist. Yes. And these are his experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that they're his experiences um, probably contributes to the kind of anecdotal uh, way that the story is told. Yep. Um, Very Mm vignette-y. Mm-hmm. and the characters come and go. I was just thinking about it. Like, the one kid whose name I can't even remember. Uh, or Clipper. It's Clipper. Yeah. Clipper, one of the Tender Trio. Yeah. After they do this heist. Yep. Uh, it's clear that, like, things are going to change. Because they all live in this area. Now, this is area isn't built up. At this point yep. in Brazil in the uh, late 50s and 60s, uh, the government was having problems with... Uh, the slums being overrun, the poor, and so they built all these sort of shanty houses, mm-hmm. like out, you know, on the outskirts. Yep. And then just the army just moved everybody out there. You live there now, mm-hmm. so they live in this, you know, this shanty town basically. Right. Which, as the years go on, would you know build up into its own sort of favela. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, but you can tell that it's like there's not a lot of laws here. We're introduced to these characters. They rob like po- propane trucks. Yes. And they just go nuts. Yes. And then they do this heist. They get in a lot of trouble. And one of them shacks up with his girlfriend. And the other one yep. tries to go back to his life. And the third one just just walks out of the movie. <laughs> yeah. He I, goes to a church. We don't see him and, come back. And I don't then he's done. Think, do we? No. He's gone. I think he turns religious. And then he somehow is saved. Good thing he was in the film. Yeah. <laughs> From a dramatic point of view. You can cut that character. Yeah. With a tender duo. Yeah. We don't need that guy. Exactly. I felt like there are a lot of things in this film, and I don't mean to... I know it's autobiographical and it's somebody's experiences, but you don't need that. Yeah. You can cut that. There were a lot of characters. It's over two hours long. Yeah. And for a lot of it, I I felt very disjointed Mm -hmm. to me. I don't want to give away my rating, but I'll talk real quick about... You know, this is one of those films that... Roger Ebert shit himself for. Do you know what yeah. I mean? He could mm-hmm. not stop talking about um, how fantastic it was. But a lot of the detractors, and there weren't many, but people that detracted it uh, said things similar to what I, I would want to say, which is it just kind of goes and goes and goes, and you don't feel any clear arc, and you yep. don't feel like it's ever going to get anywhere necessarily, and mm-hmm. you don't know when one thing ends and one thing begins, mm-hmm. and it doesn't have a lot of structure. No, it doesn't. It's a lot of and then. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Um, and... and then every time it gets in trouble, mm-hmm. it just goes, let me tell you about the something, something. Right. And then we go and we flash back or cut away to something else. Yep. And this is 2002. So this is after uh, Pulp Fiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's after Snatch. This movie reminded me a lot of Snatch. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which Snatch is, okay, so... You want to talk about this movie's violence? It's incredibly violent. Talk, go ahead. Talk about it. Um, I mean, they actually, I mean, this is a spoiler, I guess, for a movie. A kid shoots a kid in out. the face. Yeah. yeah. A kid shoots another kid. And they literally are kids. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know at any time how I was supposed to feel about any of this. Yeah. Because 
and I'm not sure this was intended, but I feel like coming a few years after something like Snatched, uh, or Goodfellas even, you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a photographer. Right. Back in the day in the favela, right. Layla's playing for some reason, I don't uh-huh. know. Um, I, I just felt like it had that sort of energy to it. Yeah. But whereas Snatched is, you know, a, a post or neo like British crime film that we're supposed to laugh at the Russian getting shot 14 times and he's still walking around. Yep. Yeah. This was like there would be some scene of gripping horrific violence mm-hmm. uh, and then a joke, you know, or like or yep. then somebody else would be killed. But that's a funny kill. Like it's funny that he shot Tuba. Yeah. For complaining. Mm-hmm. But just before that. Ned's like half of his family was killed and yes. it's supposed to be this wrenching thing. Exactly. And I just didn't know if the director got that or if he was really trying to drive home that it's just nothing means anything, man. Not not here. Not in the city of God. Forget it. Yeah, but Forget it, it, Jose. It's the city of God. Right. But it it was disheartening because um, like you said, it would be played for comedic or or it was really super serious and um knockout ned kind of he became a vigilante well, uh, you yeah know? We'll, we'll get to a spoiler section yeah um that's so... okay though that that see but that my, my thing is i think the real well let's just get let's just get to spoilers i don't want to spoil anything okay. um so let's talk about would you recommend this film or i want to say real fast i, I do want to before i give my rating I want to say something nice about it. Sure. I do think that it is an amazing undertaking because mm-hmm. I feel like it's too long, but, and there are, there's probably too many cuts. Like this was the early 2000s. So I think a lot of cuts is still the way to go. Yeah. It's, there's definitely a lot of frenetic cutting in it, yep. but there was a, there must've been a lot of footage mm-hmm. and they're shooting literally in these locations yes and you've got a cast of 50 kids who aren't actors Mm -hmm. and you're shooting gunshots and and dances and they're chasing each other and there's even just scenes and they're doing like the kind of cutaways where it's like let's show something over time yeah so like here's the corner where the drugs are and a kid comes up and it's a cut to another time another day you know uh, which is just something like the pickups must have been crazy on the film. Yep. There's one long sequence that is like, see what I'm doing, which is stood out a little, but was done well, where they tell the story of how Blackie got his apartment. Yep. And it goes through like the months of like this character came in and did this and it fades to and he walks to the bathroom, but somebody else comes in in the door, which means it's weeks later. And yep. that was really good. Like that yep. was really done well. Mm-hmm. But as far as knitting this whole story together or finding the points where we could like attach to the narrative like uh, maybe it was the maybe it was the source material but i didn't think it did that real well no so i guess since i'm talking still i'll finish up sorry um i can't say i won't recommend it okay if, does, if that makes sense <laughs> yeah <laughs> Do you know what i mean kind of like uh yeah i mean there's there are things to like about it your mileage may vary but I found myself, and I had not seen this before, yeah. and I'd heard a lot about it, and I'd actually put off watching it because I've heard, like, this is this is fantastic. Yeah. And it was like, it's all right. Yeah. It felt like a a real good faux documentary. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, it had, I don't know, it just felt like, in par- maybe, I don't know, in, in parts it felt like a real, like, if the BBC was going to do, like, a real jaunty show about the crime ridden favelas right in the 70s right yeah a little damn tv yeah it was a little um too glorified i think you think so yeah i think so mm-hmm. um okay the some of the main characters like lize who was little dice um i mean it shows him getting a lot of wealth because of the drug deals that he does and everything, yeah. so that's kind of showing it in a positive light. Being and that's a drug why you recommend dealer. it. No, <laughs> you do. Um, I don't think I will recommend this film. Um, it's very violent, and um, I think it it kind of. I mean, it shows how rough the streets are, but it, it kind of glorifies. Um, the violence as well i yeah. feel like okay so no go from you yeah 
Do not go to the city of God. Yes, that's true. It's not happening. Yep. Um, okay, let's talk a little more in depth about some of it. Okay. Um, that's interesting. I'd like to talk more about your idea that it glorifies violence. I'm not sure. I think it's the filmmaker's intent was absolutely to condemn the violence. Okay. I don't think that that was his goal mm-hmm. or um, their goal. Um, but it's. I think it's interesting that you walked away with that idea. I guess I can't disagree. I guess I'm trying to, but I can't. It it just kind of made some of the choices that they made. Like, um, I just feel like glorified and um, like the more people you kill, the higher you got in the hierarchy and everything. Right, but that's what a gang thinks. But I don't think the movie was saying... So get out there and kill some people. I guess not. But um, it made it seem like it was very difficult to not to live in this area and not kill people. Yeah. Okay. Um, Well, I mean, there must have been. Yeah. There must have been like regular people, right? I mean, there's a weird like redhead kid who's always coming back for the schneef. Yep. And uh, there's people, you know, blasting at each other. But that would be just average people. But we never really go into the lives of those people. No, we don't. Um, the most we go into is, like, Rocket's life, where he... Yeah, but he only shows up every once in a while. when, And then he shows... Like, he's always around. He kind of shows up because he wants to date uh, Alice Braga's character. Yep. Um, and then he shows up at the end because it's time to tell the story of how he became like a correspondent or got his photography job Mm -hmm. but like i could cut rocket from the film and lose nothing yeah do you know what i mean yep (laughs) he he has no effect on the story at all no he doesn't and even the way that he becomes a photographer or he gets like an internship at the end the way he gets it is not due to his skill uh, or any particular skill that he has, like you right. normally you'd see your hero would work hard or even just be lucky and be in the right place if this is some kind of like, you know, picaresque sort of adventure or something. He's literally like his pictures are mistakenly given to a person who is putting things on the front page. And I hope that, there's a story to go with that, I guess. Yeah. Good thing somebody was writing a gang story. Yeah. Uh, so we can take care of that. And then also, two for one, we can take care of his virginity problem too because the person happens to be like a hot... Uh, cubby reporter right who's down D- she's ddf yep <laughs> so, or however you say that in brazilian I don't yeah know. i know uh which was a little unbelievable yeah to and least. i guess like that ca- maybe that character has to be in the story because he's the avatar of the author yeah but if it's already like semi-fictional fiction it up yeah which is <laughs> right <laughs> tell a better story with this guy right because i never felt like there was if you're right and maybe this is where the thing comes in where you feel like it didn't condemn violence enough. If this is a morality tale, then we, you know, Henry Hill gets sucked into it. Now, there's a point where right. uh, Rocket gets a gun and he's like, I, I got I to gotta do what I got to do, man. I right. want to hold somebody up. Right. And then he meets a nice guy, Knockout Ned. We'll tell you his story later. Right. The movie goes off in another direction, but it actually refuses to do it. And then it's going to do that later. So there's got to be some point where this kid won't cross that line and somebody else will. Mm-hmm. And then maybe he takes a break to the end. Like, yep. I'm not going to or I feel fear for my life and I'm going to get out of this like right. Henry Hill. And Lil Zay won't. And he gets it in the back of the head. Yep. And he's supposed to be made. Yep. I'm getting this mixed up with Goodfellas, which I want to <laughs> watch now. And, but no, nobody but nobody followed a path like that. No. And this might all be the entire story might be true. But for me, like. Lil Dice, a.k.a. Lil Zay, yep. uh, fire album dropping uh, this month. Right. Was just so cartoonishly evil. He was. Like he's that character. It's like, we need him to do all this stuff because the story's got to go places and like, look how bad he is. Yep. So he's a eight, nine-year-old child. Yep. We know everybody has it tough and it's hard, you know, in the slum, but we are given no reason why he would murder everyone in a hotel. Yep. And laugh the entire time. Yes. It isn't even a thing where he feels pushed to do it. And then no. later, to compensate, he becomes hard. Like, as a nine-year-old, he's like, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Yes. I don't know where you get all the bullets from. Yeah, I know. 
They didn't mention that the last 10 people were beat to death with the butt of a gun, I guess. <laughs> when that kid went, he went all the way. Right. Um, yeah, I just, I, you know, and it didn't, there are other films like that where, you know, people just come and go because it's documentary style or whatever, and that's just what happens. But yep. I just, I didn't, I get the feeling that the movie really wants to present these guys to you as their characters, but yet they just kind of come and go. Yeah. And we don't really give them... I'd say, like, maybe maybe Benny, maybe Benny had kind of an arc that you could sort of follow and appreciate. Except yeah. not, this is where the morality was missing. And I'm fine. Again, I don't really mind. Like, it's, you know, City of God, where is he? Like, right. I'm fine with that look at uh, this world. But he's a murderer <laughs> and a drug dealer. And then he decides that he wants to be a surfer. Yep. And then he's almost out. And then he just accidentally gets shot by a guy who he met. The beginning of the film disappeared for the entire film, comes back just in time to shoot the wrong guy and then shot himself and he leaves the film. Yeah. And it's like, well, I can't keep track of it. Why do I care about any of this? I know. But wasn't it Blackie who shot him? That's what I meant. I don't know what I said. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's the guy we meet at the beginning of the film. Yep. Three times. Mm-hmm. We meet him three times. Here's something else. You're wanting to do the Snatch Pulp Fiction thing? Yep. Is showing... And your lack of ability to do it is showing. Sure. Because I didn't see the point in us meeting Blackie three times. Right. Like Rocket goes to see Blackie and we go, let me tell you about Blackie. And we get Blackie's story. Yep. And it's all part of this thing where Lil Zay is coming to basically run Blackie out of business. Yep. So he knocks on the door. So it's hard knock on the door. Let me tell you about Blackie. Yep. Get back to the, come back from the Family Guy flashback. Yep. Knock, knock, knock. Yep. Let me tell you about Lil Zay. Yep. Come back. Knock, knock, knock. Hold on, let me tell you about this apartment. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, what? I know. Um, it was a little confusing. The scene took, this scene took a half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> it was technically a half an hour long. Right. It was a little confusing, I think, without intending to be. Um, and then, like, the... Um, made sure you knew, like, who certain characters were that were, like, dead or almost dead. Uh, by flashing back to something. Um, and that was kind of unnecessary as well because it's like you knew who these characters were. Yeah. Um, you didn't need them to tell you again. But they felt the need to tell you um, cause just in case you didn't get it. Yeah. Um, the story of a former soldier who's living his life um, dating his girl yep. and working on the bus line yep. who's, you know, who's, who's beat up and his girlfriend's raped by the gangs yep. and then he reluctantly joins them and becomes like a vigilante turned gang murderer himself. Yes. That's a nice story. Yeah. Let's pack that into like the beginning of the third act. <laughs> right. And then let's have it come full circle in one of the few things that comes full circle in this movie, by having him killed by the son of a man that he killed, a yes. character that we introduced in the third act, we re- reintroduce, and it's revealed that he is the son of this guy that this guy errantly killed in one scene. Yes. About four minutes from the end of the film. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, there's just no structure. It just doesn't, it's very unsatisfying in that it, way. It is. Um, and they mon- they they montage, so it's not like I expect this to be the Matrix, but we build up to this gang war between the two gangs. Yes, and we're, we're going to kill them. Other side, we're going to kill them. Yep, good stuff. Let's do it. And then it's just like, what would you do? This is like this montage of like people just shooting randomly off screen and, and showing guns being yeah. shot. Yeah, and- yada yada. The best part. Yeah, <laughs> you yada yada the street war. Yes. Yeah. Give this give this kid a gun. What's your what's your name? Johnny. Right. I like alphabets. Right. Give him a gun. Right. Got it. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's dissatisfying. It is dissatisfying. Um when they were killing each other, it reminded me a little of Freaks and Geeks. A little bit. Like a Brazilian Freaks and Geeks. Yeah. Which I want to watch now. <laughs> I really want to watch a Brazilian Freaks and Geeks. Uh is it time? Should I talk about uh about the thing? Yeah. Should talk about uh Alice Braga? Yeah, I think you should. I can't even remember now because I think I was so mad by the end of the movie. But So Chekhov's uh, gas delivery truck comes back around at the end of the film. Yes. Oh, they also did that thing. 
also just in terms of structure. They so they did the one scene three times. Um, they did that thing where the movie starts mm-hmm. pretty much at the end. Yep. And then flashes back, and then flashes back inside of its own flashback, and yep. then takes a break to go up its own ass, and then mm-hmm. comes back. They drive the thing, and I know they crash it, but it doesn't like blow up, right? No. So. When are they going to get to the fireworks factory? I like they introduce I a truck full in the middle of a bullet flying gang war. Yeah. There's a truck full of propane, propane. tanks. Doesn't yeah. blow up. Yeah. This movie cost about, I think, just under $2 million. Okay. Which, man, working in the third world. <laughs> yep. Dollar goes a long way. Yep. It did look really great for, for $2 million. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, location, location, location. Right. Uh, let's talk about Alice Braga really fast. I guess okay. I don't want to do a whole thing on her, but I've never really liked her. I think that it's, I think that she gets cast because Hollywood's like, let's do diversity. Uh-huh. I mean, they don't commit to diversity by having a movie like about the lives of people who aren't white, but we need a brown in this. And right. so I think it's her a lot of the time. I've never been particularly impressed by her acting. Um, and now I know why. Okay. Because she was just some kid yep. who probably maybe had an agent and, you know, wanted to be an actress. But right. she was in this and this got good reviews. And then I'm assuming she immediately moved to L.A. and just got, got into it. Okay. But it, it's not great. If All you right. look at her career, you can look at up an actor on Rotten Tomatoes and look at their um, record, you know, their yep. the films they've been in. And except for City of God, she doesn't have a single film above 70% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's not good. No. Whenever I see her, I am immediately know that I'm in for a bad film. Okay. And I don't even I... think it's her necessarily. Sure. I just, I'm trying to think of like a performance from her where I was like, whoa, all right. Really blown. Nailed it. Your hair blown back. She's usually just, I am concerned girlfriend slash wife. And right. then at some point, someone will be taken from me, yep. and I'll probably go, no, like I do in this film. Yes. So she's got I Am Legend, Elysium, Boy. My Daughter, Get Her on the Space Station, yep. or whatever, Red Belt, that movie's a, kind of a mess, Predators, the aforementioned Blindness, uh, Repo Men. Repo Men is so bad, it's good, but not in like, oh, man, it's so bad, I love this, but like... Oh my God, I can't look away. <laughs> you know, like, I need, for edification, I need to see this. So okay. She, yeah, watch Repo Men. Okay. Um, I don't know, and some other stuff, but I guess that kind of flamed out. That wasn't really, <laughs> I didn't really go ham. Well. But I just wanted to say, I've had this for a while, and we've traced down the route. Like, oh, it, it all starts here. Yes. Like, this is the first act of this. This is the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. She's probably on a bad Netflix show now. <laughs> uh, speaking of Netflix, we watched it on Netflix. And uh, way to cut to the ad for Beasts of No Nation at the oh, end of the film there, Netflix. You really got your tracking right. Yeah. <sighs> it's disappointing. It doesn't seem to have any political stance on anything, but not in a reported, completely, objectively way. Yep. It's You've got... They do show the corruption in the cops, for sure. Yes, they do. Um, but at the end of the film, he takes this picture. And I believe a choice is sort of made where it's like he's got a picture of the crime lord getting money, giving money to the police. Yep. And he's got a picture of the crime lord with 87 bullets in him. Yes. And he can either give the one picture out, which will expose the police. Yep. Um, but might make his life difficult. Or he can give the picture of the dead crime hero yep. and basically get a job. Yes. And he does the second. Yes. And I don't know if we're supposed to judge him morally for that, but the movie has made no moral judgments about anything really up to this point. No. So we don't track the police corruption. There's this arms dealer guy who is in league with the cops, because I assume that's where he's getting like seized weapons from, to sell back into the favelas, which is like, yep. wow, that's very indicting. Mm-hmm. And then the gangsters like strong arm him. He goes back to the cops like... Guys, these gangsters are like running me ragged here. I can't sell right. my guns. And they're like, okay. They kill him yes. <laughs> and then go k- to kill the gangsters. Yes. It's it's disheartening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, disheartening. it's yeah. Uh, it's uh, it doesn't have, I mean, it has a moral center, I guess, but it just seems to 
it's not really saying anything about these crimes. Like, are these good or bad? I yeah. mean. And we don't see, like, how these kids. I, you see it one TV. And I remember I complained in the film about yeah. halfway through that we see all these kids running around. And I thought, where is TV and movies and popular culture in this? Mm-hmm. Because it's true that if you really are living, you know, in the dirt, you probably are going to lionize the um, the bandit hero, you know, that brings you money or, or gives you propane for your stove or something like that. Right. But we need to see, like, where, where are the TV shows and the movies and stuff that they're, they're watching and seeing, like, oh, that's how Elliot Ness does it or how, whatever they get in Brazil. Right. We don't see any of that until it's time for, as soon as I got done complaining about that, we needed to see a, a plot point. The, the t- a TV was turned to the plot point channel yes. <laughs> so we could see a news bulletin. And I was like, the only TV we've seen in this film is just a narrative device to continue pushing it along. Yep. And that's just bad writing. Yep. That's just bad well, writing. Well, we do see a TV get shot at one point. <laughs> yeah, I guess. But that still, again, is not really yeah. giving us narrative. And by the way, that's not how newspapers work. No. You don't just leave pictures lying around. Somebody goes, oh, I'm going to put one of these on the front page. Right. Oh, what's your name? Oh, yeah. Sorry we didn't uh, put any attribution in there. Right. This is not how newspapers work. No. <laughs> At least maybe in Brazil. I don't know. Any final thoughts? Um, if we've, uh, we went hard. We went to war with City of God. Yeah. Um, I mean, Rocket just kind of falls ass backwards into an internship. <laughs> That's so, how papers work. Yeah, apparently. It's better than being a repo man. Yeah, it is better, but still. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how realistic it really is. I I know that I first of all let me preface this joke by saying I know there are people of many different ethnic backgrounds, uh, you know, and origins in Brazil and in specifically yeah. in Rio de Janeiro. That being said, I like that the gang had the one ginger kid. I know, right? <laughs> it's kind of like Odd Future's got like that one white kid that they hang out with. Yeah. <laughs> So it kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've lasted this long, listener. Uh, I guess we appreciate it, but I'd say I still can't say don't see it. Okay. Like I'm not saying see it, but if you don't know anything about this world, it is fascinating. I just wish yeah. there was a better film. There prob. You know what? I'm wrong. There probably is a better film about this out there, but this is the one you hear about. It's not about two people. In their bathing suits on the beach. No, like it's Mika not. Thought. <laughs> uh, it's very different. Yep. And I don't. I just think a picture of Lil Zay with a gun mm-hmm. might have sold the movie more than just Alice Braga on a beach on somewhere. A beach. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the guy he meets, who's a shaman or whatever, in the alley. Yeah. Does say it wasn't really clear. Maybe he's lost in translation. But like, if you have sex with somebody period or just with your medallion on you will lose its power or whatever do you huh. even remember that no they i put don't put that seed in there i remember the and then little zay goes through his whole thing and then he likes ned's girlfriend and rapes her yeah and that's kind of the beginning of the end for him yeah but that barely there's so we've gone through we've we've discovered blackie's apartment so many times since then right. that how could who who could remember right so anyway city of god Move there today. Bring your own prop in. Yes. <laughs> the big ear bandit is tossing all his manners in a bag and wrapping them in saran wrap bandages, tossing them in baskets with the rest of those sandwiches. So when he's well, from propane to pro, pro feeling good. <laughs> all the time we go. Uh, thanks for joining us on this show. We'll be back next week. Why not? Yes. Let's do it. Let's yep. say we'll do it. And um, again, uh, we were going to tweet out what we were going to do um, before this show uh, so people could uh, check it out. But I guess this will just be a retrospective unless you've seen it. But for next show, we will tweet out what, what we'll be talking about. Um, it was a movie this time, so probably a comic. Yep. I think I'm going to pull one from the uh, shelf and we'll do a deep dive into a comic, uh, probably a trade paperback for the next show. Okay. So like I said, uh, keep an eye on the tweets and the Facebooks and all those sorts of things so you know what we're up to um, before next show date, next Sunday. Um, drops on Sunday. Yes. That's when it drops. That's right. Uh, so in the, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Just Enough Trope to get those updates and updates from us about what's going on in the world of nerdy entertainment. Mm-hmm. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts uh, where you can 
subscribe to the show. It's the best way to get it. It comes right to you when it is ready, which will be, of course, next week. You can listen to it, and then you can leave a review. We would appreciate that because we love hearing from the fans and hearing how you think we're doing. We want to hear... We want to hear what you want us to cover on the show, and also give us a rating if you could. We'd definitely appreciate it, because out of all the things you can do, besides contribute to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash just enough trope, but besides that, giving us a tiny little rating, one click of a finger, is how iTunes, that is Apple Podcasts, knows we're doing a good job. We move up in the ranks, we get to reach more people, everybody's happy, everybody can hear that we didn't like City of God, which is probably not... <laughs> what we want to get out there but we're brave we'll do it so to that end you got to give us five chickens you see the chicken is a metaphor yep i guess yep i guess i think so uh from the book knockout ned's character his name was actually chicken manny okay in the book and they changed it to knockout ned i think it was a good change because apparently being a chicken what it means something different okay it doesn't mean being scared it's like um Maybe like a chicken hawk, you know? No, that's not something else. It just means like, for some reason, being a chicken is like being good with the ladies. Okay. I don't know. Huh. So anyway, but the fact that he won't fight for principles, not because he's a coward necessarily. Right. Chicken Manny would confuse that. And so yeah. So they went with Knockout Ned instead. Okay. So instead, listener, you should go for five stars. We'd really appreciate that. Like we said, we'll be back next week talking about something spicy, something good, a little comic, a little comic to go down spicy. Yep. I'm still talking about being spicy. Yep. I don't know why. <laughs> Nobody's helping me out of this. You got to help yourself um, in the city of God. Yep. He'll help you. Yep. So that's what we'll do. And we will see you next week. We're signing off. I'm your host, Caliban. I'm your co host, Mikan Hana. Keep the geek fires burning. OFM. Bring it on your FM. No, it's 2011. Yeah. Golf wing. Golf wing.